welcome to our latest multimodal webinar. Um, today, you're going to get a sneak preview about the future of container shipping and whether we see it as an evolution or a revolution. You're viewing the webinar on our swap card platform, which allows you to ask the panel questions. Uh, the panel is on the right-hand side of the, the screen, so please put your questions there. The platform also allows you to um, arrange meetings with other attendees um, and video calls and so on and so forth. Uh, it's a great networking tool, so please take advantage of it. Um, it gives me great pleasure now to get things underway. We've got a, a very full agenda, no doubt. And I'd like to introduce you to your moderator for this afternoon, Adrian Jones. Um, described by a friend of mine as the smartest guy I ever worked with, Adrian has a first from Cambridge and an MBA from Manchester Business School and has spent almost 35 years in our business. He's worked at Inchcape, Neptunus and P&O and more recently was MD for the UK and Ireland for MOL and Director of Southern Europe. Adrian is currently the Commercial Director for Problem Solved, uh, a consultancy helping logistics and shipping companies on their digital journeys. Adrian, over to you. Thank you, Robert, uh, and uh, welcome everyone to the webinar. Um, uh, I do like your sound of your friend, if that's how he described me. Uh, you can <laughs> <laughs> send him some money later. Um, so uh, this afternoon, uh, we're going to talk about container shipping, uh, revolution or evolution. For the last few years, the news has been dominated by four themes which are clearly impacting developments and thinking in the world of container shipping. Uh, most obviously in the last year, of course, uh, COVID has thrown everything up in the air, uh, but Brexit, uh, environmental concerns, geopolitical issues such as the uh, US and China trade argument have all been at the forefront of, of people's thinking. But meanwhile, there is one major area of development that is generally revolutionising the way that we live uh, and how industry performs, uh, and which has the potential to help logistics and supply chain industry manage uh, these other disruptive forces sometimes referred to as the digital revolution uh, or part of the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, I am of course referring to the way in which data is being generated, shared, stored and analyzed in amounts and uh, speeds that are increasing exponentially uh, every year. So until recently, uh, I think it's true to say the shipping industry was largely uh, an analog operation relying heavily on traditional methods. And with the advent of the new technologies, such as big data, connectivity, Internet of Things and, and the like, shipping lines are starting to see the benefits of digitalization as they push for greater operational uh, efficiencies uh, and competitive advantage. Uh, the president of uh, Consberg uh, Digital, who are a provider of next generation software and digital solutions to customers uh, within the maritime industry, has said digitization is one of the key focus areas in industry today and it is challenging the way that companies work, it's tearing down walls, it's challenging business models, and it's happening rapidly. But the question we're going to be looking at today is, is that really happening in the container uh, shipping industry? Are the players part of a revolution or are their strategies and approaches being driven more by traditional models and ways of thinking with perhaps the adoption of digital technologies being more evolutionary and, and, and supporting uh, other strategies? So we're going to explore that during the next uh, 90 minutes with the help of our panel of experts, uh, all smiling at you, uh, from the world of container shipping. So uh, I will introduce them one by one and uh, give them a little bit of an opportunity to tell you uh, about the role they're playing and something about the big things that are on their company's agendas and, and, and how they're thinking at the moment. So uh, if I just take the order that people are appearing on my screen. So Peter Livy um, has been with uh, Hyundai uh, uh, HMM since uh, 1996, where he is currently Managing Director Great Britain uh, and also a Global Sustainability Ambassador for the company. He's a fellow of the Char Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport and brings many years of experience, not only as a senior container shipping executive, but also within the global supply chain and uh, contract logistics sector. Uh, Peter is one of the team who actively represents HMM within Clean Cargo, which enables uh, business to business collaboration with leading retailers, manufacturers, ocean carriers and logistics service providers dedicated to integrating environmentally and socially responsible business principles into the maritime supply chain. So he's got a wealth of experience and I'll let uh, Peter introduce himself further and tell us what's on his mind. 
Hey, thank you very much, Adrian. Well, in in my main role at the moment as the uh, Great Britain MD, really we're we're dealing with lots of pandemic related issues. Uh, the big dip in the early part of the pandemic meant that we had a suppression of, of global trade last year. Then we had a huge surge of uh, business and now we've got uh, that dramatic surge in Europe and the UK. Um, and that means that all sorts of uh, supply chains are under extreme strain. Ports are having a much bigger throughput of business than they were set up to be doing in many instances. Uh, the volumes coming from the Far East and elsewhere are huge. Obviously, the, the states had big issues as well previously. Uh, and locally, we've got things like driver shortages, uh, ports, depots, transporters having uh, a greater amount of time spent trying to do simple things, basic jobs normally. Um, restrictions due to COVID on how many gangs can work ships, uh, all the alerts that go off if uh, MD has an infection and the impact that has. Uh, so everything has got a much bigger volume. It's a lot busier, but it's all happening much slower and causing all sorts of um, uh, issues. And one of the things close to my heart at the moment is is to do with seafarers and the fact that uh, they've been unable in many cases to have a crew change because many countries don't allow them to get off ship or their home country doesn't accept them back and you can't get off a ship unless you have a clear way to get home etc so that's really to me a global scandal and really we do need international intervention there but I also think that COVID uh, has been a, a wake-up call related to things like supply chain resilience. Um, you know, we see so many examples now where everything has been based so much on, on lean supply chains that there really has been uh, very little uh, stretch left in order to cope with what happens so, for example, we've often had to get involved in things like preventing port blockages uh, due to warehousing shortages and so forth. On the good news side, I'm really heartened that the incoming president of the United States signed an executive order yesterday uh, allowing the USA to rejoin the Paris Agreement. And with my sustainability hat on, that's brilliant news so, because we really need to strive forward to... Um, look at that other big crisis that we've got, which is climate change. So hopefully that gives you a picture of what's going on just now. Okay, well, thank you, Peter. Obviously a, a real mixture of day-to-day -day, uh, practical hands-on issues there and some more strategic themes, uh, environment uh, and, and how uh, global trends are, are changing and, and political policies uh, and the like. And one word perhaps just stood out to me from that, the word uh, resilience of the supply chain. Uh, and I think that is something that we definitely want to be talking about uh, today is uh, how do we build in resilience to the supply chain? What things are going to, to help us to manage that as we go forward with all of these uh, disruptors? So if I could turn uh, to uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Haycock, who is currently Area Managing Director for UK and Ireland at Maersk. Uh, he joined the company in 1984 uh, and has been there for most of his working life since. Uh, his career has taken him through a number of postings across the globe uh, with responsibilities within uh, Maersk Line, Maersk Logistics and Damco. Uh, and most recently, he has spent some time in the US uh, as CEO and president of uh, Mesk Logistics in North America uh, before he moved back to the UK in January uh, 2019 to take up the role of sales director within Mesk and then managing director uh, from uh, February 2020. So uh, welcome, Jeremy. Uh, and perhaps you'd like to give us uh, um, uh, an overview of what's on your mind. Yeah, thank you very much, Adrian. Uh, and, and I should hasten to add, I actually started in uh, this role in March of 2020 and uh, I don't know if anybody recognised that month as uh, for anything else uh, that that happened uh, at that very time. So uh, a, a good a good timing as usual, stepping in to to a new role. Look, uh, over the past year, uh, 
really my focus has been on uh, on uh, our transformation journey in Maersk, uh, one that started two years ago. Um, so we are undergoing a huge transformation right now in, in many aspects and, uh, and really following what is our, our global vision of uh, uh, becoming the global integrator of, of container logistics. And uh, uh, we are changing uh, really everything that we, we do and we are really also changing uh, everything around how we do it. Um, and, and we believe that the industry has really stood still for way too long and uh, customers uh, have suffered um, really because of it. And you can call it, you know, you can call it revolution, you can call it evolution. At the end of the day, uh, you know, things need to change in this industry now. Uh, that for the benefit of our customers and, and frankly also for the benefit of our customers' customers. Um, product flows uh, go hand in hand with digital flows and therefore it's certainly important that we, we talk about that uh, today and, and, and in general. Uh, and, I'm, uh, you know, and then, of course, everything just got significantly accelerated uh, due to uh, COVID-19. And I'm sure we'll, we'll talk about that uh, later on. But right now, of course, as far as COVID-19 is concerned, like everybody else, this has been a challenge that uh, brought with it uh, a, a number of, uh, a number of uh, issues. And I'd like to say that I'm really proud of the way that our company was able to um, uh, to radically uh, change and radically adapt to uh, the new uh, new circumstances that we were facing in a, in a really agile manner, and we did that because we very early on had the, uh, the from the outset said we have three focus areas. One is uh, making sure that we protect uh, our employees. Number two, that we serve our customers, and number three that uh, we, uh, we, uh, we uh, stay really close to our local societies and try to benefit our local societies as best we could. And as long as we focused on those three things and uh, really prioritized everything we did around those, uh, I think you know, we were able to get more out of the situation or be better prepared to handle the situation than we perhaps otherwise would have been. Um, so we all know, of course, that, that these challenges that, that COVID-19 have brought with us, uh, have brought with it, uh, that we are all facing currently, uh, that are caused either directly or indirectly by COVID-19, uh, whether that be, you know, the port congestions, whether that be uh, the lack of space on ships, whether that be uh, all the equipment being in the wrong places at the wrong time around the world. Um, you know, these are, these are real challenges and it's something that we as an industry, of course, are spending an enormous amount of time on right now trying trying to address uh, quite uh, uh, quite specifically as it relates to that and and uh, you know at the end of the day i think it's a really important message to get out there that i feel that the whole industry really has come together and uh, and i personally am uh, really in awe over how 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 well together the industry various parties in the industry have worked um, you know, you could so easily have ended in a situation where there would have been an enormous amount of finger pointing going on. I really do not feel that that has happened. At the end of the day, you know, nobody was at fault. Nobody saw what was coming. Nobody could see what was coming. And, and, and so we're all in it together. And I think as long as we continue to cooperate and, and work together, we will get the most out of uh, or the best result out of the uh, current challenges that we face. And then maybe I should just add, along came just another little challenge called Brexit, uh, just, to, just to flavor it up a little bit more. So that's also something that I certainly am spending a fair amount of time on. Maybe that just gives a little bit of a flavor, Adrian, of uh, what I'm up to these days. OK, thank you, Jeremy. That's, uh, that's excellent. And uh, obviously, COVID dominating a lot of what you said there. And I think one of the interesting questions, which I'm sure we'll explore this afternoon, is how much everybody has recognised how much COVID has changed the world. It's thrown into focus a lot of things that are, uh, are weak or not working well or a risk within the supply chain. Uh, and there's a lot of good intentions and a lot of good talk about how this will change the game uh, and, and that we'll all behave differently afterwards. Uh, very, it will be very interesting to see if that is the case and whether COVID really is a spur to, to some different behaviour or, or not and whether people's uh, strategies change. Uh, and the second thing, of course, as you mentioned, uh, um, 
uh, Maersk as a as a global integrator of logistics, I think was the phrase you used. Um, and of course, uh, Maersk is, is well known uh, for leading the field in that in that integration field. Uh, um, and uh, HMM have also recently made some announcements that they're going down that route. And it'd be interesting to see you know, why would you follow that strategy? How's that? How does that help? So we'll, we'll talk about that later as well. So perhaps a good place to turn now actually is to, to one of the people who may be one of your customers um, and uh, who perhaps uh, working for Agility sits uh, somewhere in between uh, the cargo owners and shippers uh, and the shipping lines. Um, so to Chris Stokes, who is currently head of Ocean Freight and uh, for UK and Ireland at Agility, uh, which is one of the world's uh, leading uh, logistics companies. Uh, prior to this, he was responsible for the company's UK Ocean Freight procurement and uh, before joining Agility in 2005. He worked for HMM, uh, for CP Ships and uh, Conship. So he has plenty of experience both as a supplier and as a customer uh, within, the, within the container shipping industry. So welcome, Chris, and uh, perhaps you'd like to give us a pers your perspective on, uh, on how things stand. Yeah, thank you very much, Adrian. Yeah, uh, nice, to, nice to be here. So yeah, as, as you've explained, I head up the, the um, Agility's Ocean Freight product for the UK and Ireland. So looking after our FCL product, our LCL product, and also um, alongside that, our, our, our container haulage product as well for, for kind of collection and delivery in the UK. I mean, some of the sort of the key challenges that, that we're faced with at this moment in time have, have certainly been touched on by, by Peter as well at the start. I mean, at the moment we're in a, you know, a, perhaps we all hate to use this term as it's been banded around many times over the, over the last year, but we are in an unprecedented situation in the, in the ocean freight market. It's a, a, a certainly a a scenario that, that we've never seen before in, in, in reality, whilst we've experienced peaks on certain trades to, to be faced with the challenges that we're facing at this moment in time is, is unprecedented. Um, and we're seeing it across multiple trade lanes. Equipment shortages um, are causing a massive issue, obviously, in, 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 in Asia as well. And then we have the infrastructure problems in the UK, which, we, which we're all having to deal with as well. And we have, a, we, we have a vicious circle in some respects in terms of you know, the vessel diversions and emissions because the ports can't work with vessels, you know, the congestion at the UK ports because of empty containers, um, and then, then the additional knock-on impact that has on the haulage market. So, I mean, that's, to me, that's probably been the, the, the biggest challenge or the biggest area of um, focus over this last year is to, is to make sure that we're working as hard as we can to support our customer base um, and obviously working alongside our, our, our shipping line partners as well to try and try and maximize everything that we're doing together but, but I mean certainly some of the some of the themes that we can we will touch on today um, have, have certainly been highlighted and to, to, to a greater degree it give, given what we've gone through over the over the last year in terms of visibility um, you know and, and, the, and the flow of data and um, certainly that's something that we I'm keen to explore today as well because that certainly has a has a massive impact in terms of and how, how we can keep everybody updated along the supply chain. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you, Chris. So, yeah, flow of data and flow of data between different parties um, is clearly a, a theme that we, we are going to look at uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, we have somebody who, uh, on the panel, uh, who uh, is at the forefront of helping companies to achieve that. Uh, there is, uh, Wise Tech Global is a company uh, that provides technology solutions to the supply chain industry um, uh, around the world, uh, and they have a number of different uh, products and companies, but I'll let Mike explain that. So Mike DeAngelis is Senior VP and global, uh, of Global Carrier Strategy and Digitization uh, at Wise Tech Global. He has 24 in, uh, years experience in the transportation industry, uh, having started his career at Maersk Line in North America before moving to their global headquarters in Denmark. Um, and he started with Maersk in customer service and sales before moving into the area of e-business. And uh, he's never quite escaped from that, it seems, because he eventually became the company's global head of product management, uh, special projects and e-business. So uh, Mike then uh, worked for Intra for a while, uh, a company that uh, all of us will be aware of as one of the early stage uh, impacts of, of digitization and digital activity in the shipping world, uh, before joining Wise Tech Global in their Australian headquarters uh, and he's currently working for them from his uh, base in Denmark so uh, welcome Mike uh, and uh, perhaps you could give us uh, an overview of uh, uh, of what you are up to and, and wise tech and, and how you see the world of course thank you Adrian and uh, great to be here thank you for having me 
Um, so I currently work for YStack Global. We do provide, as Adrian said, uh, software solutions uh, to the logistics industry. Um, our CargoWise platform is licensed in 160 countries, um, translated in 30 languages. And the main focus of the software is really to provide opportunities um, for increased productivity uh, for our customers. Um, we have over 17,000 uh, logistics companies globally uh, utilizing our software um, you know, in uh, one of those uh, or all of those countries. So what we see is we have a role in the industry of providing some uh, abilities to deal with these tailwinds that we're currently facing. So whether that be Brexit or whether that be COVID, um, the solutions that we're providing are allowing our customers to better deal with a lot of the uh, effects or stay ahead of having to deal with the effects uh, of some of these um, I'd whether it be them pandemics or be them um, regulatory uh, changes that are happening in the industry. My role, um, having started at Maersk, uh, has been mainly in e-business, as Adrian had stated, uh, since the early 2000s when you saw, you know, the initial uh, intros in GT Nexuses and Cargo Smarts uh, come on the scene. Um, I started in a very niche team, and uh, it's quite exciting to see how mainstream a lot of the e-business and digitization and digitalization, uh, you know, we're seeing today um, was really just sometimes uh, thoughts on paper, um, you know, back in the uh, in the early late 90s, early 2000s. So it's certainly exciting to be here, exciting to be able to provide some insights in this panel. Okay, well, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mike, for that. Uh, obviously, the development of all of these tools and uh, all of these products is moving on a pace, and those are forever. Uh, forever changing, uh, perhaps behind the scenes, um, and we don't think about them uh, day to day. So it'll be interesting to hear a bit more about this. I ought to uh, declare a little bit of an interest here. You'll notice that uh, I'm, I'm billed as Adrian Jones from Problem Solved. A lot of me, a lot of you will know me from my uh, uh, 15 years uh, uh, as uh, managing director and then director South Europe for for MOL. Uh, but over the last couple of years, uh, I've been doing. Uh, some consultancy work in various parts of the logistics industry and I'm uh, also working for Problem Solved uh, Limited as their uh, commercial director. Well, Problem Solved um, uh, are a uh, partner <laughs> with CargoWise, uh, an implementation partner, which as I say is one of Mike's, uh, one of Mike's uh, companies. So it's, it's a product that, uh, that I know well uh, that, uh, that is having quite, a, quite an impact uh, across the industry. So uh, I ought to declare that interest in case you uh, thought I was sneakily being biased. So, uh, so if we if we just start um, with, uh, even though there are uh, um, uh, there will be a lot of questions about strategies and what's happening as a result of all of these other factors and day to day that we're talking about, uh, and Robert uh, is keeping an eye on the uh, the feed of questions for me, and we'll feed some of those in. But if we could just kick off, uh, because I'm sure everybody here is aware of uh, what the difference between digitalization, digit digitation, um, blockchain. Um, big data, all of these sort of buzzwords that we hear kicking around. Uh, obviously, it's something I know all about. Um, but a friend of mine uh, would like to know uh, exactly what all this stuff is. Uh, and perhaps you could explain where it fits in uh, and what it might have to do with the logistics industry. Yes, thank you. Um, so in terms of uh, trying to clarify digitization, digitalization, we'll start there uh, because I've used both in my title uh, in the last uh, couple of years and have made changes uh, based on what I've read and, and uh, due to conversations I've been in. Um, so digitization really is the start. It's really where you're applying uh, technology in order to um, automate an existing uh, manual or paper-based uh, process. And it, it generally results in some sort of cost savings or efficiency. Um, when you go to digitalization, then you're really talking about automating more complex processes with you know, the eye towards creating new opportunities out of that. So it's not just a singular you know, digitization of uh, a paper form or a singular process, but you're trying to find opportunities for either um, increased revenue um, or some sort of value where you're leveraging digitization, but you're looking at it more as, as a larger, you know, it can be multi-process, um, uh, you know, uh, 
in, uh, venture, I guess you'd say. Mm -hmm. um, then you get into digital transformation. And I know Jeremy had mentioned this uh, earlier as something that Merck's was uh, currently going for uh, as a part of what they're doing over the last uh, couple of years and will continue to do. And that's more about organization. And that's leveraging your digitization and your digitalization in order to become actually a, a you know, more agile company that's better placed, not only for cost efficiencies, but you're better able to serve your customers. Um, so I hope that gives a little bit of background, at least on the terminology mm -hmm. um, and how that might come up in some of what we're going to discuss. Okay, and um, Mike, where, does, where does that fit with um, blockchain and, and, and uh, other words that we hear like that? Well, I think, again, you know, blockchain is a technology, right? So it's a distributed ledger technology that allows you, you know, to perform certain functions in either a more secure manner, um, in a, um, a digital manner, in a uh, more trust, you know, based manner. So, again, it's something that you can apply. It's not in itself going to cause a revolution in the industry. It's just one tool. It's one you know ability that we have uh, in order to uh, apply it in certain situations. Be there's uh, one that comes to mind is smart contracts. So the ability to take you know uh, data, which of course you get from the digitization and digitalization processes, um, also you know things like uh, being able to trust parties and being able to um, ensure that transactions um, that have happened cannot be changed. And again, trust is a big part of this. If you, if you marry these together and have a automated process, and, you know, which can be called the smart contract that can execute based on the party being you know, known and trusted, uh, the transaction you know, being you know, trustworthy and uh, not being changeable, yeah. now you can start to execute things in a much uh, more expedient manner as and uh, again trust is a is a big issue within our industry um you need to be able to trust the parties that you're dealing with you need to be able to trust that events that we've said have happened or will happen have happened so you be able to then say now we can execute payment or now we know that it's arrived now we can you know uh start the customs clearance process whatever the case may be again blockchain allows is something that you can apply to to help with with those processes. So I don't wanna to get too far into, you know, blockchain being the savior of, of the industry. Um, we've heard it as a buzzword for many years now. It actually is toned down a little bit, but I think you'll see it applied as one of the many technologies that will allow us um, to, to deal with, you know, uh, trust and to deal with uh, our data and to move forward in the industry and automating processes. Yeah, so a lot of it's about efficiency of processes and uh, yeah, yeah, and automation of, of, of activities. Yeah, okay, good. Well, uh, now that that's clear, perhaps we can uh, go around the panel and talk uh, a bit more specifically about uh, what it is that your companies uh, are doing uh, in 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 the sort of digital sphere or how you're applying digital technologies uh, to uh, to help you. Uh, move forward and to achieve some of these efficiencies, perhaps uh, efficiencies, cost savings, quality improvements, um, better control, uh, these sort of aspects. So uh, let's start back with Peter um, on that question. Hey. <clears throat> well, in container shipping, um, digitalization and the use of data has already had a huge impact. Um, so I'd like to consider ships uh, these have become sophisticated sensor hubs and data generators uh, producing and transmitting information from anywhere, often in real time. And advances in things like satellite communication are uh, meantime improving connectivity, allowing uh, for increased uh, volumes of data being transferred at ever lower cost. So these digital information flows uh, are driving the automation of processes and functions and can have a really positive impact on safety and commercial and uh, environmental performance. Last year, 
HMM signed uh, an MOU with Samsung Heavy Industries uh, in order to collaborate in research and development um, and innovation in the field of smart ship operations. And as part of this collaboration, HMM has adopted something called s Vessel, which is the most advanced smart ship solution designed by Samsung Heavy Industries. And we've got that active in five out of our 12, 24,000 megaships uh, launched last year. And digitalization and decarbonization have become integral factors in the pathway to sustainable growth. And this convergence between ICT and ship operation technology provides a variety of solutions, such as enhanced vessel and fleet tracking, onboard data analysis, collaborative maintenance, uh, monitoring of propulsion, and so on. Uh, in September last year, HMM opened our new fleet control center in Pusan. Uh, and all of our 24,000 uh, TU megaships and the eight 16,000 ships that we're bringing on stream starting the second quarter uh, all feature uh, the latest in smart ship solutions. We now therefore have real time monitoring. Uh, which provides full visibility of vessel performance and operations. Inspection and repair work uh, can be uh, looked at from afar. Uh, ships machinery can be monitored. Each vessel can be remotely monitored and identify and react to any unexpected threats or obstacles on board the ship or close to the ship. So we continue to test and analyze operational efficiencies and plan to apply smart ship solutions to other vessels already in operation. So this is already kind of there for us. And uh, at the same time, we've been undergoing a different kind of transformation because we've, um, since last November, we integrated a new cloud-based legacy system uh, which should have finished the rollout in the next uh, month or two. So we're very much on the cusp of a revolution as far as we're concerned in how we operate and the transparency and visibility that that provides for other parts of the supply chain. Um, and I suppose thinking about uh, what Mike was saying, uh, when one of, one of my friends asked a similar question, I suppose digital technologies, uh, when we're thinking about digitalization, things like internet, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, analytics, artificial intelligence, and blockchain, these are all uh, digital technologies uh, which need to be there to allow shipping digitalization to happen. Digitization is just converting information from a physical format into a digital format, which allows those technologies to work and then provides for some of the digital solutions that, that Mike mentioned, such as smart contracts, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, like I mentioned, we've, we've got now with our new smart ship technologies. Um, and then that will drive management practices like uh, having more digital partnerships uh, and strategic along those lines. So all of this is, is in a big melting pot and there is a massive amount of opportunity. So I think that we may talk about evolution or revolution, uh, revolution but really it's a revolution, I think. Okay, uh, well, uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Peter. Uh, transparency and visibility, those are clearly uh, important 
themes, which are, you can do all of this digital activity uh, and keep it to yourself, but uh, I think part of the power of it is that once you've got it in that format, it's very easily shared and a lot of different parties can sort of link into the same data and, and, and do things with, with, with that information. So I think that's something we'll come back to, uh, particularly as we as we come to Chris in a moment to, to look at the, sort of the, the customer supply as the side of the, the, the chain and, and what information they're getting. But perhaps I could turn to Jeremy first and uh, just find out uh, from another the shipping line uh, perspective. Uh, are, th are these your experiences at Maersk, uh, or are you uh, applying digital techniques and technologies in different different ways? I think we're, we're probably doing both that and, and, and also different ways. Uh, frankly, even, uh, um, you know, <clears throat> I mentioned our transformation journey as a company, uh, which you know absolutely includes our very big part of that is indeed the the, the digital element, if I can call it that, and we'll try to avoid having to use those. Uh, longer ways of, of, of saying digitization and, and so forth. <laughs> but it really is, in all seriousness, it's, it's, just, it's, it's, a, it's the integral part of, of our transformation journey. And, and we are investing very heavily right now in specifically uh, that area, whether that's in startup companies uh, who uh, are looking to take the complexity out of shipping uh, or, or whether it is uh, by developing our own digital products. Um, and, so for instance, what we're trying to achieve is uh, let our customers do instant bookings, manage and track shipments. Uh, and in fact, we released a, a large number of uh, quite sophisticated applications last year. Uh, we have our one uh, Merse shipment app, uh, app which, uh, which tracks cargo. We've enhanced our EDI solutions. We've launched products such as Merse Flow, which really is a digital platform to help our customers uh, sub, uh, optimize the supply chains. We've got Maersk Spot, uh, I think many people have heard about, uh, which is a really a simple way to, to ship goods with an easy online booking system at fixed prices and with guaranteed loadings. Uh, but we also had uh, things like trade lanes, which we started a little bit further back, but is now starting to take form. And, and trade lanes really is coming back to a, a, a neutral supply chain which uh, is, is underpinned by, uh, by blockchain uh, technology. So really a super exciting uh, development there. And the key, key, of this, key across all of this, in my opinion, is an ability to, to not only develop individual products, but be able to make those products uh, talk, talk to one another, uh, to make IT solutions as integrated as possible. Um, and you know, the uptake on these new products uh, over the last year has been absolutely amazing. We're talking many fold uh, growth. And I think a lot of this was actually also accelerated by the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, not a lot of good things came out of COVID-19, but maybe that was another thing that really forced a lot of players to really accelerate some of their developments. And certainly for us, uh, it, it did uh, force us to do that. And, you know, at the end of the day, uh, our mission is to help our customers, big or small, manage their supply chains, with, with much greater agility and much greater flexibility. And in many ways, what we're also trying to do is take what is frankly an antiquated industry and plant it solidly, and will move it solidly into the 21st century. Um, so uh, it's a really exciting journey uh, and uh, a lot of things are happening. And again, I, I don't know whether that's a revolution or an evolution, but certainly something that we're very focused on. Okay, uh, thanks, Jeremy. And uh, integration again. So we got transparency, visibility, integration. Uh, the word collaboration hasn't come up yet, but I, I do wonder about you know, a lot of people doing a lot of things independently of each other. And maybe that's something we'll talk about in a moment. So, Chris, from a uh, customer perspective, how are you seeing this? Is what the shipping lines uh, is what they're doing being helpful or or not? And uh, what what are agility up to in in their own right uh, in in this field? Yeah, I mean, I certainly think what you've, what you've just mentioned in terms of, of collaboration, I mean, that certainly is the, is the key part for us, really. I mean, there is obviously huge, huge focus and huge de development on these, on these new technologies as well. I mean, Agility is ourself. Um, you know, we had have, have some real key focus on what, 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 well, what certainly what we term as the sort of the bird technology. So not only blockchain, the Internet of Things. But robotic processes and data science, and these are all sort of mutually um, reinforcing. So, I mean, they all rely on one or, one or the other to help us extract the, the, the greatest value from the, from, from the supply chain process. I mean, we ourselves have, have launched um, a shipper freight program. So that's an online logistics platform that's op optimized to help um, businesses across, 
businesses across the globe, um, you know, basically trade with ease, should we say, and, and, and to try and make and, and simplify the whole process. But as we've said, really, from, from, from what you've just touched on, I mean, certainly there's, it's, it's how this flow of data can, can come through to them from the shipping lines right from the very start when Peter's talking about the smart technologies on the vessels. And um, we have the container side of things as well and how that information can throw, flow through the supply chain. And um, certainly some of the experiences we've had recently in terms of um, vessel emissions and vessel um, um, sort of cancellations and things like this as well that have gone through the process in terms of how we can make sure that that information flow is continued and comes through to our to, to, through us as a 3PL and through to our final customers so they can plan accordingly. Because the issues that we face now in terms of these these last minute changes, et cetera, it, without, without some sort of data science behind it and, and, and some greater analytics on it, it certainly makes it far more difficult to plan. And then that has a knock on consequence to, to, to the haulage industry um, and, and to the ports themselves as well. And then, then we all led to the frustration that we've all experienced in terms of you know customers screaming for their cargo and 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 at times it's very difficult to pinpoint you know that the latest situation should we say so that's certainly what where we're keen and, and certainly to say as a company we're, we're investing heavily in in some of these technologies but we can't do it alone and and, and that's the that's the key it's it's without it, it's not everyone independently developing things it's how we can work with, together to try and simplify the supply chain as well which is which is the key focus for us yeah, I think that collaboration, um, when we, we heard the word integration, how to make products talk to one another, if everybody's doing their own thing, that clearly uh, could could be an issue. I don't know, Mike, whether you have a perspective on, on that specific side of things or whether there's uh, something else you'd like to say from, from what you've just heard. Yeah, something that comes to mind, um, you know, which I guess is a bit humorous is, you know, uh, standards are a great thing. Everyone should have one, right? Um, so I agree. Uh, standardization uh, and collaboration can go hand in hand in order to make things more transparent. Um, when we talk about evolution and we talk about what, what a little building upon what Chris was just talking about, what I've seen is, you know, from a where is my cargo standpoint, let's say, or where is the vessel? You know, you've gone from being able to say, well, we know where it was. So tracking was about, you know, it was in port yesterday. And you know, we've progressed to where is it now, where you have real-time or near real-time abilities to say, well, the vessel's in port or leveraging IoT, you know, that something uh, you know, has just crossed a border and, or has just been uh, in-gated. So you know, it's very powerful. Where, where I see things are going, and again, building upon what I have been hearing on, on, uh, on this um, discussion is predictable you know, predictive analytics and being able to say, where will something be with relative certainty, whether that's using uh, AIS in order to, uh, you know, track a vessel's movements or whether use leveraging IOT, what Peter was bringing up to be able to say, you know, this is where the container currently is and this is its condition, or this is the, where the vessel currently is. And, you know, this is a condition of, of the engine of the vessel. You can, marry these data sets together and be, you know, it's very powerful, but it's only powerful for the ecosystem if it goes beyond the individual company. And as Chris was saying, and as you were saying, Adrian, um, you know, you get into that collaborative environment where you're sharing data um, and then you leverage standards such as what the DCSA is out trying to promote in the industry. And you really have a powerful combination um, you know, by bringing all of these things together. So, uh, yeah, as, as a ship, shipping line, uh, obviously, it's I know where the ship, where the container is on on my ship. Um, but if it arrives in a port and goes into a black box, essentially, I may know that I've booked a haulier, but I have no idea whether it's going to connect with that haulier and at what time. So, it's joining all of that picture up, as you say, to move from the where was my cargo? I could tell you it was on the ship. I know it's come off. Uh, where is it? Well, it's in the port somewhere uh, to where exactly in the port and when will it come out? And, and is the haulier ready? And, and is he expecting it? And will he deliver it? That, that's the power uh, of all of this. But that only comes by uh, the industry coming together um, uh, and the players in the industry uh, integrating in that way. And I think it's an interesting question of whether that needs to be an industry wide initiative or whether individual companies can 
can form alliances with, you know, with other parties to, to make to make that happen. Who should take the lead? Those those are the sort of uh, uh, yeah, those are the sort of questions. How how do, how do you bring that about? So I don't know. Um, just before we, we'll come to the questions that I gather are flooding in on, online, but that, that strikes me as quite an interesting uh, angle. So I don't know. Is there somebody who particularly wants to to comment on that? Yeah, uh, Jeremy. Yeah, yeah. Well, the only thing I just wanted to comment on was, <clears throat> of course, that is where blockchain the blockchain technology can really come to it right because that is bringing uh, together all the information from the ports from the customs authorities from uh, the shipping lines and so forth in a neutral manner or, uh, and and with that is able to uh, provide all that information and uh, the journey that we are on with our particular blockchain technology trade lens is uh, to sign up more and more parties to enable that to happen yeah okay um yeah, and that's a technology that then is is available uh, for, for people to access, you know, whoever they are, wherever they are. So that's that's a sort of come industry platform, albeit uh, well, trade lens is is a collaboration between lots of different lines and parties, if I understand correctly. Is that right? Yeah. Yes, it is. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, several shipping lines have signed up to trade lens yeah. and that and so forth. Yeah. Okay, all right. Well, uh, perhaps uh, Robert, uh, you've been monitoring the um, the board of questions coming in, the chat of questions coming in. Uh, is there one in, uh, is particularly interesting that follows on from what we've been talking about? Well, I was just about to ask one. It, it, it was about blockchain, actually, but I think Jeremy's touched on that. If maybe if we have time, we can come back to that. But um, this is an interesting question that's got lots of likes. Are container shipping companies looking for new competitive advantages and examining new ports? especially uncongested ones, and a sort of supplement. What do they think about hydrogen as a fuel? OK. Um, Peter, you're, you're my main man for environment. <laughs> Although uh, Maersk have just made some announcements about uh, ammonia and other fuels that they're going to be using in the future. So uh, we'll no doubt hear something from there as well. But Peter, perhaps you'd like to kick off on that. <laughs> OK, well, um, yes, on the environmental side, uh, yeah, hydrogen is one of the uh, exciting possibilities. Um, so if we think about it, so international shipping, so we, we're transporting about 80% of global trade by volume in shipping. Um, we all know that already shipping is one of the most carbon efficient modes of transport. But the challenge is we need to be zero emissions. And Maersk have also got the same ambition. We're all members of something called Getting to Zero Coalition. And uh, we all have an aim to um, have some zero emission vessels. And one of the potential fuels is hydrogen or things related to hydrogen. So one of those options, for instance, is ammonia. Um, so, but ammonia in itself, if it's not produced in a green way, it's not a, a zero carbon fuel. Uh, but if ammonia, which contains hydrogen and can be used as fuel, was generated, say, by solar energy, then you have the green, uh, they, they do that by electrolysis, and they could produce ammonia um, by electrolysis, have it as a fuel. Uh, then you've got the huge issues uh, that need to be overcome, which is why many players in the global uh, industries, energy, transportation, etc., all have to align to enable a new fuel like that to be something that could be used in future zero emission vessels. So that, that's one example. Hydrogen is one of the, the lead uh, potential new fuels because uh, nobody really wants nuclear fuel uh, powering ships, so that's really off the board. Um, but deep sea shipping will probably be a little bit later in coming up with the zero emission vessel um, solutions. It does need that bit more of a push for things like hydrogen and so on. But short sea solutions are much closer because fuel cell technology has developed to such a, a place 
the Roro vessels and other short sea Lolo uh, vessels could actually be produced. And indeed, I believe Jeremy's organisation has, has announced an ambition to produce zero emission vessel in the next three years for short sea sort of activities. So on the hydrogen question, absolutely. Uh, on the new ports question, I could answer that. Um, but that also has implications about infrastructure and the capabilities of uh, new ports to be able to manage volumes. Is it connected, the rail, roads? Is it close to population centres? So that's got huge questions attached to it uh, in the background. And given that the size of our deep sea vessels are so large, uh, that is a huge challenge. But the big challenge really is uh, the hinterland infrastructure. How close are you to population centres? Is all of that there? Have you got the rail connections? So, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there will be new opportunities but they're not that straightforward, some of them, as far as that's concerned. Yeah. Jeremy, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, you know, look, you know, Peter has said, said it all well, just in specifically on the ports, uh, I completely agree with what Peter just said. It, it, this, you know, it's not as simple as saying, all right, let's just go to this other port and, uh, uh, because it's cheaper or it's uh, uh, because they can move more containers per hour uh, uh, through, through their cranes or whatever it may be, there's, there is, it's much more complex than that. But of course, we're all looking at uh, what competitive advantages we can get from uh, from, uh, from changing from one port to the other. Uh, so, you know, you always do your due diligence. Just on the other question, I just want to comment on it because I think it's a great question. And I think we should all be super interested in the uh, ability uh, for the sake of our planet and for the sake of our children and, and, and children's children and so forth. Uh, uh, you know, it's just super important that we we have an agenda, a clean, clean, uh, clean fuel agenda, and, uh, and and everything that goes with it. And we have come out with a statement quite recently where we have committed uh, to by 2050 uh, having a net zero CO2 emission status as a company. And um, I've just been uh, on a conference uh, with within our company, um, and uh, and it was reiterated several times that we want to. Yeah, we want to beat that. It's such an important agenda for us. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that. Well, let, let me throw something quite interesting into the mix, actually, that uh, as two big deep sea lines with your focus on mega vessels and uh, the, the sort of questions about, you know, will the UK become a, a feeder outpost and all, all of these sort of things and, and the limited number of big ports that can handle those. You could go to the other extreme, particularly on 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 short sea. Uh, I've been doing some work with a an autonomous shipping um, uh, startup company, and they're looking at a fleet of something like uh, uh, anything up to two thousand uh, vessels of only one hundred and eighty TEU each. So we're talking about short sea shipments, but there'll be zero emissions, and they will be able to call. You will need a certain amount of technology at the receiving port, but they will be able to call it ports pretty much anywhere up and down uh, up and down the coast uh, which means that in when you look at infrastructure uh, for inland transport you're dropping it off as good as where it needs needs to be so you can make a substantial impact that possibly uh, whilst it sounds very you know futuristic and, and a bit unlikely the technology is there for it to happen um, there's a lot of regulatory issues and, and, and legal issues to, to be overcome um, and not, not least with the use of uh, unmanned vessels and the like but uh, uh, all of this sort of digital stuff comes together and that could be a real game changer for the short sea uh, market and already a lot of this technology is embodied in in uh, semi-automated aspects of of the big container ships um, so we might we might be some way off a, a big container ship being fully automated, but you know those days you could envisage uh, coming coming one day. That would be an example, I guess, of, of how 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 it you know, could completely change the picture. Peter, you're obviously disagreeing with that. <laughs> I don't think we're that far off, to be honest. I think the technology is is um, much closer, yeah. but uh, there's huge issues to do with testing and making sure everything is safe. Yeah. Because who would want a huge mega ship with little if no crew uh, heading towards your city? Um, so yeah, it's I think like even like a
cars and we've seen the autonomous trucks under test already. Mm -hmm. Really, the technology isn't that dissimilar, but you just have to make sure it's super safe yes. in order to have it implemented. So much of that's there. And your comments on the short C issue, actually, it, it, what it does change is the perspective on uh, multimodal. It, you, because one of the opportunities from the, uh, the zero emission small vessels is actually you can do stuff that trains can't do. Uh, once a big volume of cargo is discharged at a base port, a hub port somewhere, um, there is that capability to, instead of it going for some of the trunk leg uh, on a truck, you could get it to some of the outports and be much closer to the destination. So it is still a good example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Chris, I guess uh, you're you're not so interested in this subject uh, from a customer perspective. You know, does this all seem a bit remote to you? I mean, it's obviously important that shipping lines are being environmentally responsible and moving in 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 this sort of a direction. But from a customer perspective, uh, what's what's your key priority and in, interest in in uh, what's going on? I mean, certainly from 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 agility's perspective, I mean, we have a we have a huge interest in 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 the in the whole area. I mean, but we have to remember, really, in in terms of our role in the supply chain. I mean, sort of ninety percent of our of our carbon footprint is generated either by, you know, how our cargo moves, whether it's on airplanes or, or, or ship trains or trucks, and, yeah. and and they're sort of out of our control, um, or or out of our supply chain control, should we say? So, mm -hmm. I mean, we work closely. We're part of the you know the carbon trust and the clean cargo working group. So we work with the likes of, 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 of the guys on on the um, on the panel today. In terms of that and we try and invest in, in in new technologies as well so whether that's smaller things such as solar projects you know paperless branches those types of things there's a there's a huge focus for for, for our, our organization to do to do our bit as well that we can in, in in the supply chain so certainly um that's a big interest i mean certainly the the, the automation and, and and moving cargo closer closer to the customer is, is something that's close to our hearts as well but again, going back to some of the earlier points, it requires collaboration from all partners in that as well, because it's one thing, um, you know, moving the cargo closer to the customer. We need to make sure the infrastructure is around that as well. Um, and making sure that the haulage, the haulage companies are, have, have available resources and they're not simply, you know, moving their trucks up, up, up country just to accommodate that, because then it defeats the whole object of the, of, of the process as well. So yeah. there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge part that we can all play in that. Yeah, okay. Excellent. Go on. Go on. Uh, Jeremy, yeah, just real quick, you know, I, I just want to say it should be something we should all be super interested in. Look, container, the container shipping industry represents more than 2% of global CO2 emission. The container shipping industry alone represents more than 2%. So we can have a real impact on, uh, on, on CO2 emissions across the globe if we alone within our industry can, uh, can, can tackle this problem. Yeah, get, if we can get to zero, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mike, I don't know whether uh, uh, the products that uh, WiseTech are involved in, are they uh, pointed at any of this sort of area? Well, you know, this is a bit outside of my area of expertise, but what I can say is, you know, we are providing, you know, uh, innovative solutions and creative, creating innovative solutions. So yes, you know, we're, you know, known for our freight forwarding and, and customs brokerage, but we have, uh, liner and agency, um, we, you know, deal with uh, Inland Depot, you know, uh, software and technology. So, you know, there are uh, elements of this that, of course, we could uh, collaborate on and co contribute to. Um, so it certainly is exciting. It's something that I think, again, is for the benefit of everyone, if we are collaborating and doing our parts to either share information, create transparency, or, or help with the actual innovation itself. Okay, great. Robert, what else uh, are people wanting to know about? Well, there's uh, several questions about this and apologies to those people who've asked them, but I'm going to try and synthesize it into the one for the panel. Um, it's about whether the, the technology that's been discussed um, can help with the, um, the empty equipment problems that we've had. And the sort of uh, concomitant question about that is when does the panel see things getting back to, in inverted commas, normal? 
Okay, let's uh, maybe just let's start with the let's start with the technology angle from that, Mike. I I, I do know that you've got some things that help handle <laughs> empty containers. I'm not sure you're going to uh, alleviate the crisis entirely at the ports of of great big piles of containers. But uh, again, what, how how does what you're doing contribute to this? From our side, again, it's the you know we may not have something that directly impacts this, but our solutions surround much of, of these processes on making sure that either you know you have increased visibility, you have transparency, uh, we can help with the predictive technologies that allow um, you know us to know where containers are, where you know uh, inland depots may have uh, the empty containers uh, that may be required you know somewhere in order to provide, uh, you know, customers the ability to manage their exports uh, efficiently or carriers to be able to know where their container stock is so that they know whether to send a trucker to one mm -hmm. versus the other. So again, our, our technology surround a lot of this and uh, could be instrumental in the collaborative efforts on being able to piece things together to, to alleviate some of the supply demand challenges. I mean, I think uh, there's a lot of different strands have come together to, to create the box problem that there is. So, uh, Peter, what, <laughs> how, how often do I tackle it? HMM hand tackling this? <laughs> well, I was going to go backwards a little bit. Uh, Mike mentioned earlier the, uh, the D DCSA, who um, have been... Uh, so this is a collaboration between shipping lines uh, trying to set standards. What was it? What was it? Digital container shipping association and they've been actively setting standards so it's the the digital bit first in order to enable the next thing to happen which would be things like uh, this would be an internet of thing item right so a container thing could have a transponder you would know what it is if it had a transponder and everybody was able to have that transponder communicating up and down the supply chain. Uh, so transponders are there. We need the common language. That's why it's foundational for the DCSA to do things like make sure that we've all got the same standard because that triggers everything to do with that interoperability occurring. So that means that smart container solutions can then occur and enable mass deployment in the future of um, interoperable smart containers. So most of our containers don't have transponders, but some of them do um, nowadays. But if, if the future had all of these devices, uh, such as transponders installed, then you wouldn't need a lot of the physical tracking through the gates and all that sort of stuff that happens at terminals and depots just now. Your container would be able to tell you where it was and for the likes of Chris, et cetera, he would be able to know where his container was, uh, even if the truck that it was being delivered on didn't have a transponder, if the container did, that would give uh, another aspect of um, visibility going forward in the future. So this is part of the, the future uh, evolution, revolution that could really open up visibility and interoperability yeah so, so that would maybe, go on go sorry. on jeremy no, far away no 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 i i was just going to say maybe just to answer the question around when is this going to get fixed and i unfortunately i don't have the answer but but what i can tell you is uh, the, the, the situation is improving quite significantly and has done over the last few weeks uh when, when by no means there but just bear in mind what you know what caused the current uh, situation that we face right now which which is you know, first and foremost of course the the completely unexpected uh, huge demand for uh, moving cargo uh, from asia in, into the uk um, and and with that we ended up with um, uh, having uh, the, the containers uh, sitting in a much bigger number in the UK rather than being ready to uh, be loaded up in Asia. And then you add to that the fact that because of this big rush and because of many customers' inability 
to actually receive the goods or store them in warehouses, they sat in containers and they hogged those containers, which then couldn't get back into, into circulation and, and back out to Asia to be filled up. As I said, a number of solutions by all the players in the industry are, are being worked on, and we have seen, we have seen some good progress uh, in that. And, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen next? 2021 uh, is not going to be an easy year. Let's, uh, let's not kid ourselves. It's going to be another 2020 in some form or, or fashion or other. And, uh, and we're going to have to face those challenges. And that's where, it, uh, you know, certainly digital uh, technology is going to help us you know, and everything from forecasting and everything we all have, uh, you know, in place. So you could sort of put that angle to it. It, uh, it is going to be interesting. Uh, and, and, you know, speaking on behalf of my own company, you know, we are literally choosing to ship empty containers out to Asia in place of full containers for a couple of reasons. One reason is that they get turned around much faster uh, and then therefore get back into uh, circulation faster. And number two is they're an awful lot lighter uh, and, and therefore we can fill our ships in, in terms of number of containers on ships better. So we're doing these sort of things, but of course you do that and then you get unhappy, unhappy customers on the other side who wanted to ship cargo out to Asia that you then don't have space for. You've got to find that balance, but we're all doing these things. I think within, you know, unless things change radically, I think within the next month, I think we will see the industry having specifically on that point, having stabilized a little bit more and uh, in terms of equipment availability in the right places. Yeah, no, I think it's quite interesting to, to reflect on well, what what could we or what should we have done differently to, to avoid that situation? Can, can we avoid a similar uh, crisis? Yeah next time round, let's hope there's not a next time round of quite the same uh, magnitude, but the next dis disruptor or thing that, that causes something like this, you know, what drives it? And I guess this is where digital uh, informa and information flows and uh, being able to predict what's happening uh, you know, are all helpful, but they can't necessarily avoid it. In this particular case, you mentioned that lots of containers are, are stuffed full of cargo and effectively being used as, as warehouses. Um, and, and part of that is that 98% of the warehouse capacity in the UK is full at the moment. So uh, if there were more warehouses, then that, you know, that would have taken a blockage uh, out, of, out of the system. So uh, maybe if we got more warehouses, uh, this wouldn't happen uh, it, it, you know, should similar circumstances arrive next time. But then maybe there'll be something else in, in the chain. So it's a question of predicting that and what are, you know, what are the strategies that, uh, that people can take. But that's beyond the shipping line. Uh, you know, the shipping line can't take those strategies. Uh, it, it was it was less of a container industry problem, more of a more of a distribution uh, issue um, in, in that case. I don't know, Chris, if you've got any perspective on that. You've been very much the victim of it, I suspect. <laughs> well, 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 absolutely. I mean, we are the victim of that. I mean, and without wishing to sound too controversial as well, I think there's there's an element of this that we can talk with in terms of, and again, I'm not, not pointing fingers at anyone on this particular panel or anything like this, but in terms of shipping line strategy, shall we say, in terms of carrier haulage versus merchant haulage and things like this as well, allowing where, where empty equipment can be returned to, rather than perhaps if um, being penalised and being forced to take containers back to, to a port when actually that port is already congested or, or shut out for empties. So I think there's, I mean, we have had certainly a, a vicious circle that we've faced over the last um, last 12 months in terms of um, the, the problems that are being faced, you know, in, in terms of vessel diversions then cause problems for the haulage, haulage industry. And, and in, 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 in turn, that, that, that cost is then borne by by us as a 3PL and then ultimately by the end by the end user as well so those those sorts of elements in terms of how we can again coming back to that collaboration part side of things is how can we have a sensible approach where we all have our own strategies but also let's not force that strategy when, when actually it makes no sense overall on in, in some aspects if it's only compounding the problems that are currently being faced yeah, I mean, it's got, I think, different shipping lines have handled the situation in, in, in different ways. Uh, Maersk perhaps has a bigger network of short sea services and operates in, in perhaps more ports than some of the other lines. So they've had more access points to get containers in or in, in or out of, uh, of the country. Um, I mean, I, I know somewhere like Portsmouth Port, which you wouldn't immediately think of as a container port, but it does have a small container operation, was offering its facilities to help shipping lines uh, evacuate their empties. Now, for most uh, of the big lines I don't think that would have been anywhere on their agenda but I know two or three of them uh, were talking to Portsmouth and and indeed were able to put feeders in there to, to alleviate the problem so maybe 
shipping lines need to think out of the box in these situations uh, about the different ways they, they can handle it. I remember back from MOL days when we had a shortage of container storage space, you know, we were looking for all sorts of creative places that we could we could store containers around the, the country. And uh, we, we, uh, of course, without spending too much money, that was uh, <laughs> that was part of the name of the game. But perhaps the boot's a little bit on the other foot now as, as shipping lines don't seem to be short of uh, short of cash, at least for now. <laughs> let's not get onto that subject. Over to uh, Robert for another question. <laughs> um, yeah, we've, we've got a few coming in talking about contract season, which hopefully we'll get back to, because of course it, it um, might be a bit of a, a sensitive question, but there's a really good one here. And it's, it's to do with the fact that um, lines have historically always had um, either an in-house sort of forwarding um, business or an arm's length forwarding business. So not all lines, of course. Um, but as uh, certainly the We've got two panelists uh, who are working for lines that are becoming more integrated uh, logistics providers. Is this something that has been uh, enabled by digitization or is it uh, other reasons driving that? And, and how, do, um, how does Chris as a forwarder view uh, the lines becoming more virtually integrated? Excellent. That's it. A very good question. Who wants to shoot first? Do the customer want to have a go at the shipping lines or vice versa? <laughs> Perhaps uh, Jeremy, I mean, Maersk is, uh, is, has, has been most vocal in terms of its strategy of, of integration and uh, integrating uh, forwarding activities or, or what might be called the, the forwarders patch into their operations and doing end to end. Uh, activities and movements. Uh, what's driving that strategy? I mean, obviously, digitization and digitalization allows you to do it um yeah well maybe you know i, th I think for me this the simple answer is what's driving it is uh, customer demand um, uh, this is what we are seeing that a, a, a large number of our customers are, are saying to us well you, you know you need to be able to offer a little bit more than a uh, a, a port to port movement and i just want to be very clear and that is that we are not a, a freight forwarder uh uh, in the, the NBOCC sense, uh, certainly not a, a, a freight forward out there. Um, and, you know, there's there's little doubt that that, that between the, the shipping line and freight forwarder communities, there has always been competition. You know, there has always been the element of, you know, do uh, we have customers who, who prefer to book through a freight forwarder uh, on, a, on a freight forwarder contract, or do, we, or do the customers prefer to book direct? That's been going on for many, many years. All we are doing as a, as a shipping line now is saying we want to be able to offer some of the additional services such as uh, even warehousing, where supply chain management and, and some of those services. So in that sense, we're not really stepping uh, onto, the, uh, onto the patch of, of, of the uh, freight forwarder. And in effect, you know, it, uh, when our strategy came out, um, obviously there was a lot of controversy around it and because people mis misread what, what our intentions were. But as, of, uh, as, as we speak today, I, I personally feel that the relationships that we have with the freight forwarders uh, remains really strong and remains uh, based on, on, on a lot of trust. So we're, we're, we're actually really comfortable in, in the current uh, scenario. Okay, and Peter, your CEO in his New Year address announced that HMM may be going down the same route. Is that really happening, going to happen? Uh... Well, I suppose, um, I mean, our, our CEO came from a sort of 3PL type of background, so so he's, he's quite keen on, on that aspect. But similar to Jeremy, we've actually, for many years, always uh, been overlapping quite a lot with what forwarders done. So on the one hand, HMM-wise, we've never had an in-house uh, or arm's length. But we've had lots of customers come to us asking us for solutions. So whether that's setting up and uh, warehousing solutions in Central Europe or something else that's similar to that. We, we used to do it in the UK as well. Um, there has been that sort of big overlap so I, I don't think it's such a big issue because really um, there has been, there have been times where some of my freight forward NVOs uh, or 3PLs have come to me to ask me to help them with a solution, 
which I would have thought is something they would have been offering, but sometimes we're able to offer it or assist them with that as well. So I think it's much more of a virtuous circle than uh, a sort of us and them sort of thing. I think it's much more of a collaboration. And, uh, you know, that, that, that's how I've experienced it so far. Uh, and obviously, many of us have to have physical assets. So, so occasionally, we have to have something related to warehousing. Uh, we, we, we have to have contract fleet of trucks in order to assist with doing the, the final mile deliveries or collections. We have to do things with trains. So yeah, a lot of it sort of would get to that sort of stage. And obviously what, what Jeremy and Merska have been talking about is a much more integrated solution, but it's not an us and them. It, it is much more of a virtuous sort of circle of collaboration, I think. Okay, so from the shipping line perspective, it is it is customer led. It's it, it's from customer demand, and because that's a helpful thing to provide to the customers. But nonetheless, Chris, it probably is directly on your patch in some senses. <laughs> Do you see it as helpful, a threat, nothing to worry about? <laughs> Have you got a different sector of the market to go for? <laughs> well, I mean, first and foremost, we mustn't forget. I mean, overall, how how fragmented the, the logistics market overall is. I mean, there's a there's a lot for us to for all to play with, should we say, in terms of, you know, the, the whole marketplace. And in, 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 and in essence, I mean, there's, there's also huge complexity in the supply chain as well. So where we can add some alternative solutions to things, that's, that mustn't be, you know, mustn't be sniffed at that. But, you know, for us, you know, experience having boots on the ground, so to speak, you know, sort of common integrated systems, they'll, they'll help in that, in that solution. But certainly, you know, the role of um, a 3PL or an MVO, whatever you want to, to call us in terms of, what we can bring to the party versus, you know, um, you know, what, what we're talking about here is a multitude of services and a multitude of options across uh, multiple different alliances. And I think that's the different different solution that we're offering to, to the marketplace rather rather than, than the integrated solution. But we yeah. certainly don't see it as, as, as a threat. There's obviously an impact on the business. There's certain, um, certain times when there are um, conflicts of interest, shall we say, and that, and that makes some of it some of the discussions slightly slightly more complex or, or slightly more heated, shall we, shall we say, at times. But as as we say, there's been no difference in terms of um, over the years in, in terms of what we would consider direct carrier business versus um, versus borders becoming involved in in that business as well. So so certainly from our point of view, we don't see that it's you know that, that the end of anything or the end of the relationship between between shipping lines and borders. It certainly makes brings to some complexities, but I don't, I don't, I don't see a, a, a major issue. Okay, I mean, I think that there have always been customers who prefer to stick with one line, and those that want us to, to to go with, with, with a broader approach, and we'll we'll go through forwarders, and I, I guess that won't change. There's, interestingly, of course, with COVID, there's been a lot of talk about uh, too many eggs in one basket being part of the problem of why supply chains for individual companies uh, fell apart talk, there's a lot of talk about spreading risk so uh, you know contrary to that to to going with a particular shipping line to do everything maybe this is the time for the forwarder uh, it, it gives an opportunity to spread that risk for them unless they want to manage it in-house and, and deal with multiple uh, shipping lines yeah okay uh mike i guess you've got nothing specific to say on this in, in this particular area I, don't I really can't can't speak for our customers be those three pls or or carriers uh you know or a mix of of them but what we can do is assist in turn you know providing uh solutions that help the industry as a whole become more productive um so yeah. we can you know uh, assist in providing elements of that, whether it's for transparency or collaboration, whatever the case may be. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Robert, next question. I see time is ticking away. We've only got 12 or 13 minutes uh, left. So uh, uh, next question. Yeah. Um, this is a, a, a question of the panel and where they see the pinch points possibly um, with regards to information flow. And there've been two questions about that. One, as it maybe applies to ports and inland distribution um, and the other um, about uh, delays in transit and so forth. Is, are there pinch points and, um, or, or is, um, have, have events recently given us the impression of there being pinch points in that information flow? 
Chris, that might be a good question for you to, to kick off on because you're seeing you're seeing the complete chain of information and uh, from the customer perspective. Yeah, well, I mean, we only have to look at a, a standard shipment in terms of and, and to see how many pinch points there are in that supply chain process, starting from from when the when the cargo leaves or is, is, is first produced, to then how it how it moves to the port, and then from the port onto the vessel, and that and that whole supply chain process there. So for us, you know, when it becomes to, 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 to arrival, should we say, then you have the customs regulations and that process that works it through there, if there's been a, a port health hold or anything like this. So there are many, many for us, what we see, many pinch points in that whole process. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mike, I mean, I guess this is what Cargo Wise is all about. It's, it's managing the whole chain from one end to another and, and a lot of multiple parties being able to access it at the, the relevant time to, to get information. It is, it is. And I, I believe where you see problems where different actors within the end to end transport may be using different providers, may have different solutions, software solutions, different KPIs in order to, you know, when does data get, you know, submitted, how does it get submitted? Who does it get submitted to? Who has access to it? Who doesn't have access to it? So this is where I live, you know, uh, within the whole ecosystem is trying to establish partnerships and, and get collaboration across multiple parties in order to have that transparency. Um, and it's not easy, quite frankly. You know, we have a lot of data. The data sometimes doesn't get out of its little silos. Uh, trust has come up a number of times in this panel, and I think you know, there are technologies that are attempting to, to leverage you know, um, their technology in order to provide uh, a better information flow, interoperability factors in. So you know, it, it's not perfect. It has a, while, a ways to go. Um, some of it is the fact that you know, we have to make you know, um, information much more evenly distributed across everyone and less held within silos. Um, so the ability to collaborate is going to be extremely important and you know, standards are going to be extremely important um, in order to sort of support that. Yeah, I guess it, it's, one of the issues is that if we look across the whole supply chain that there are different parties trying to own the information or to, or to manage it. So you will see ports trying to be the center of everything, shipping lines trying to be the center of everything. You'll see the forwarders trying to present themselves as, as the place that the portal to go through to get this information. Uh, there are there are you know, companies such as Wise Tech producing you know, sort of across the across the chain type solutions, but uh, not everybody's got access to all to all parts of it. So. Uh, it's a bit of a conundrum. I, I, I don't know if anyone wants to say anything specifically about this or whether we should move on to a, another question and, and just leave that as an observation. But yeah, who should take the lead is, is clearly an issue. I'll just say one word. Blockchain. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> and we all know what that is now, don't we? <laughs> There'll be a test later. My, uh, Robert, <laughs> what else? Um, this is... Uh, quite a good question I think with the growth of, um, of everyone's digital operations does the panel see there being um, greater scope for new door-to-door -door services and I suppose new port-to-port -port services does okay. the digitization give more flex into uh, the system Peter yes yeah I think um as uh, digital technologies evolve and digitalization occurs, it always uh, enables the ability for more disruptive uh, changes to, to occur. Uh, or we can say more opportunities to change and develop. So I think, uh, Albeit uh, carriers, shipping companies, we, we are very, we've got a very capital intensive thing with big physical assets. But um, yeah, uh, as you mentioned earlier about the, the much smaller feeder vessel uh, potential, etc., uh, the ability for for disruptors to be involved in the market increases, and in the end, I think that helps how everything works because everybody has to rise to the challenge of whatever's going to happen next 
So we have to be on the front foot in order to make sure that we are noticing what the opportunities are next uh, and try and get to a place of being um, a first foot in that new area rather than being uh, surprised by a disruptor moving in. Yeah. I mean, there are the sort of big companies you, you always hear mentioned, you know, your, your IKEAs, your Amazons, even Google, people like that. Will they get involved in these sort of areas? You know, they're not transport companies. They're, they're delivery companies at best <laughs> at the moment. But uh, you know, will they actually enter the market, um, Jeremy? Yeah, uh, look, I don't know about uh, if I can answer that specific question. And, and in fact, the question was so good, I'm not sure I entirely understood it, uh, 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 Robert. What I would like to say is that there is no doubt in my mind that digitization uh, will enable uh, the agility that is the requirement of uh, across the industry right now. It, it's the big, big word. Agility is, sorry, uh, uh, there's somebody on our panel who certainly would agree with it being an important word. Uh, exactly. but, also, <laughs> <laughs> but, but I think uh, at the end of the day, you know, this last year has just proven that fact. Um, you know, a number of, of, of big actors, a big, uh, big customers in, in, uh, in the UK uh, went from a just-in-time to a just-in-case philosophy overnight. And to be able to completely turn it around, if you didn't have a, a, the, a digital vehicle behind it, probably impossible. Yeah. A lot more goes into it, of course. But, but, I, but I think that does, does say a lot. Okay. Um, I'm keen to pack in as much as we can. We really are down to the last five minutes or so of our official time. So, Robert, is there other burning questions? Well, um, again, I'm, I'm synthesising a few and um, just with the usual caveat about uh, reminding the panel that they need to be careful about what they talk about. There have been lots of questions about uh, pricing and, and antitrust stuff, uh, which I'm going to synthesise into something uh, which is also... Um, an interesting question. It's, uh, and maybe each of the panelists could just summarize this in a few words, how they view uh, the forthcoming uh, contract season. Who wants to go first on that? <laughs> Peter. <laughs> I'll be very brief. Um, obviously supply demand has got an enormous to do with how the contract season traditionally works. This time, as I mentioned way back near the beginning, supply chain resilience is going to be a huge issue going forward because of the big wake-up call we've had from COVID and the impact that has on the way that um, the players involved in making contracts are going to have to consider the way forward and what commitments might, might be made uh, on both sides uh, with regard to making sure that there is a much greater de degree of resilience in their supply chains. But it's not just the shipping part, it's the whole supply chain that that's applying to. Uh, and we already mentioned about the huge warehousing issues, et cetera, uh, and the other disruptive things we've got going on, such as you know Brexit has been mentioned uh, amazingly briefly in this, but things like customs, et cetera, uh, changes, uh, caused by the Brexit exit and the, 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 the greater degree of waiting time people have to uh, the, the narrowing of the, the window to get things onto ships. All of that is part of the big thing. But yeah, supply chain resilience as well as supply demand is going to be making a big change, I think, to, to how people are viewing contract season. Jeremy? Yeah, I, I honestly don't have anything to add to that. Okay. All right. Chris. Yeah, just I mean, really just to reiterate what 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 Peter's saying there as well in terms of I mean in, in the past perhaps there's been no sort of perceived value or, or requirement to for, for some customers to, to focus too much on their booking accuracy and you know their vendor management and the booking confirmation visibility and that side of things. But certainly I think over the last um, 12 months and, and, and the impact that COVID's had, it's shown how fragile some supply chains are. And, you know, and I think that's going to be a huge part of, of, of the contract season in terms of how there, there can be some great security placed around, around those elements. Yeah. 
I mean, I think with with contracts, it's been kicking around in the industry for years, but there's always been this problem that uh, in the good times for shippers, uh, shippers don't always honour the uh, volumes. They'll ship, they'll move their cargo to somewhere where they can get a cheaper rate. Uh, you know, now we're now the boots on the other foot, and I have a lot of sympathy for the way that some, some of the lines are uh, uh, reputedly uh, behaving in terms of uh, making hay while they can, because for years they, they've been faced with this ever downward pressure on 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 rates. So. Luckily, we've run out of time, so I won't be able to get myself in too much hot water by t uh, talking about this. But uh, I think, uh, you know, until until we've got that, those sort of contracts where each party can hold the other to either a volume and service commitment uh, uh, and, and a price commitment that goes with it, uh, then uh, then we're never going to solve this out and, and move forward. So uh, I think uh, we've, uh, Mike wants to say one final yeah, Just thing. a parting uh, thought, you know, uh, I'm not on either side of that equation, so I'm not going to speak to that directly. What we can say is, you know, uh, we're one of the, the parties out in the market that is trying to provide solutions that allow each side of that equation to collaborate most effectively um, and, and, you know, manage uh, this process effectively. So that's where we will fit in. Brilliant. Well, that's a good positive note to end of, of hope <laughs> to, to end on. So, uh, Robert, uh, if you'd like to wrap up as you see fit. Yes. Well, I, I thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in and um, hope you enjoyed it, too. Sorry we weren't able to answer all the questions, but hopefully you've got uh, some real insight about uh, how the market might uh, evolve or revolve uh, into the future. I'd also like to extend my thanks to, um, to our panel. Um, very graciously gave of your time and your expertise and it is much appreciated. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for joining. <laughs>